very excited to introduce to you this fantastic engineer. I first saw him uh, two years ago uh, at .js speaking about uh, offline and peer-to-peer -peer applications, and I was completely blown away. And then uh, his one of the most uh, popular node package creators, module creators. Uh, he also created uh, Browserify. And uh, yesterday, I also learned that he actually built his own house in Hawaii, which is fantastic, right? <laughs> Let's give a round of applause for James. Uh, yeah. He had a fantastic talk at the Node.js meetup, and I'm not expecting less here. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Good, how's that font size for the people in the back? I see a thumbs up, any thumbs down? Okay, fantastic. Hello everyone, I'm James uh, Halliday, or you can call me Substack, that works just as well. I am a member owner of this thing, bits.coop, which is just a kind of business that, where there aren't bosses, just everybody has an equal stake in ownership and also an equal stake in how things get decided. Very simple. Uh, just do consulting stuff mostly when I'm not working on other fun projects. Uh, you can follow me on a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized social database which has a social network and some other things. I'll talk a little bit more about it, called Secure Scuttlebutt. Uh, if you find these notes later, hang on a sec, my, okay. There we go. Uh, you can also look at these slides on Secure Scuttlebutt on Git SSB with this URL, if you wanna type that in really fast. Don't actually type that in, you can load that uh, from the legacy web and then you can clone this repository. Okay, so I'm here to talk about peer-to-peer -peer on the web. Uh, also, just as an advance warning, um, in the second half of this talk, there's going to be moving pictures and loud noises. So if that is something that will cause you some problems, it's, feel free to, to leave during that section. I'll also give you another heads up when it's time to come to that part, okay? All right, again. So the web, this is an open utopia of uh, free exchange of information, free ideas where anyone can publish, right? I think not. I think that this is false uh, for a bunch of reasons that I'm going to go into. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about dimensions of access. Uh, we had two great talks at the beginning of this conference about uh, accessibility and also about kind of how our assumptions about how people ought to be as imposed by machinery of technology can really cause some undesirable outcomes. It can cause people to feel bad and it can cause them to not be effective and not, to not experience the, the great tools that we have with technology. Some other dimensions of access that I wanna talk a little bit about. Not everyone has access to the internet. Access to the internet is actually expensive. Uh, maybe access to the internet is, only, uh, is really limited, it's really metered. Uh, not everyone has electricity. For example, I... Uh, I live off grid in Hawaii. I have some solar panels, but I always have to keep a, keep a watch on like what the battery levels are of all of the systems. And if they break and I don't have time to fix them, then I'm not gonna have electricity. So uh, it's not just me though. It's like many people around the planet have sort of have to be aware of their electricity levels if they use technology and internet access is really difficult too. Then there's also dimensions of access about uh, abilities. So abilities to perceive sounds and contrast and text size and sound and color. These are all really important in terms of modeling a better web that we want to achieve, like the world that we want to live in, not necessarily the one that we're handed by history, which is unfortunately where we find ourselves. Uh, also, di different devices have different capabilities and it's important to be really granular if you can. For example, my webcam doesn't work. I don't know why, it just doesn't. So I can't use things like uh, Google, uh, some. Some of the WebRTC chat things don't work on my machine because my microphone works fine, so I could talk, but 
they don't really gracefully degrade, so I can't really do that. These could also be situational, so you know, you might be outside in the sunshine, like I think we ought to be with our computers more. But uh, it's really hard to see things um, on a laptop screen, for example. Anyways, there are a lot of barriers to participation on the modern web. So things like domain names actually cost money, and because they cost money, they require access to finance. So if you think about what exactly that means, well, not everyone has a credit card, not everyone has a bank account. You might not have the documentation necessary to show the bank to get a bank account. It actually can be quite involved and complicated. Uh, so maybe pe some people just use cash, if, if that. Um, servers and hosting cost money, and they sort of demand perpetual rents. So domain names and servers, these are things you have to keep paying into the system or else your technology stops working on the web. That is not a great state of affairs. Also, these things require technical skills, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. But this is another kind of way that we need to be thinking about building our technology. So because many people like, don't run their own networks or it's more difficult, we have platforms. So platforms, uh, these providers own the infrastructure. They own the servers, the domain names, and everybody knows where to go to get the content. And unfortunately, these platforms have very strong network effects. So they sort of, uh, they sort of uh, pull in people who might not otherwise get an account, but all of their friends do. So you don't want to be the holdout uh, because you want to talk to your friends. Unfortunately, this means that platforms get to decide a lot of things on behalf of the users. So they just make decisions arbitrarily and push them on users and users just have to deal with it. Uh, this creates an implicit power dynamic. So servers are private property. They're DNS records, they're hardware, they're, you take capital and you put them toward these things and you get uh, servers and server capacity. And clients, meanwhile, uh, people running web browsers or maybe native applications have to just deal with whatever the server people decided. Um, and they don't really have any kind of a say in the matter. So I think that this default architecture that we build things on the web for kind of has this implicit idea of hierarchy of clients and servers and this one directional relationship. Also uh, paternalism because the people who decide how the, how the service ought to work just decide things for other people and just push those decisions down. And I'm not really okay with that personally. Um, there's also this kind of like consumer relationship. So you have consumers and producers, you don't really have these uh, mutual relationships of peer production. And that's, what, that's the kind of internet that I want to participate in. Also the rich get richer, of course, when you have this sort of a, a hierarchical structure. Uh, so these things generate some strange outcomes. Uh, so for example, if you're using a centralized service like Gmail or Dropbox or something, if you're sitting next to someone in the same room, you're on the same Wi-Fi, you want to send them a file, you send it on, in an email, you send it on Dropbox, that file might go all the way across the planet and back. It's like, this doesn't, why does, why? That seems really odd to me uh, when you could be using the local resources available in that system, and then maybe if the internet is metered, if the internet is slow, that shouldn't be a problem. But it is, if you, use centralized services. And this is sort of, here's, here's a bunch more reasons. I don't really need to go into too much about all the details, but when you depend on these centralized servers, they can just shut down whenever they want. It's really not up to you. Um, they might change their API as well. That's really difficult because when they change their API, everybody else has to rush and like fix their code. And I don't like rushing. I, I want to build things and just forget about them. <laughs> They could, should just keep running. I shouldn't have to think about, well, these external dependencies that I have now kind of create fragility where there are better alternatives. Uh, another big use case that I'm personally very interested in is building things that work offline. And offline technology is inherently distributed. It's inherently different. So things I like about the web, though, are URLs and links. Uh, it's a universal application runtime, that's pretty cool. You don't have to ship around binaries for particular platforms. It's really easy to run software. Uh, you get access to different system 
services like a microphone or the sound cards or network or that kind of thing. So the web has some redeeming qualities. And so the question that I pose is how can we build a better web that's more equal, more democratic, and more suitable for the real world? Here's what I think about that. Uh, I think that we can have cooperative alternatives where peers, that is people running the software, like clients, provide the infrastructure for each other. Then we don't have to have gatekeepers and walled gardens of app stores and whatever. We don't have to have uh, uh, this sort of central topology. We can have something that looks more organic, more like things found in the natural world. And we can also have things like cooperative peer production and mutual aid networks. These are really difficult to do on top of centralized platforms because of the inherent hierarchies in there. So uh, here's a great little quote, uh, from each according to their ability to each according to their need. I think this is a good general principle when you're building uh, things that aren't clients and servers. So in peer-to-peer -peer technology, uh, everything is a client. Even servers are clients. You can still have servers, that's okay. But clients, uh, uh, servers aren't actually special in any way. It just so happens that servers are clients with a pretty good internet connection. And maybe they have more disk. Or they have these different abilities, but they can provide those abilities to everyone. They don't necessarily have to provide uh, this kind of extractive, like you have to go to the server to get everything. We don't need to do that anymore with these techniques. Here's a hypothetical version of what we can build with these ideas. So, for example, imagine if we used the Service Worker API to build a package manager. What would that look like? Well, then we could get data from peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, the users could configure and control when they upgrade and from who they get updates. So users, if they don't like the updates being pushed by a particular version, they can go with a fork. And that maybe they don't like the fork anymore. They could go with another one. So I think it's important to think about how we can give users back control. Uh, of course, there are two kinds of peer-to-peer. -peer. I like to think of them. They're, they're ones that perpetuate scarcity, like cryptocurrencies. And as a currency, maybe that's OK. But I prefer peer-to-peer -peer systems that perpetuate abundance, like BitTorrent, where as many copies of files as you want. There's sort of this idea of the free exchange of information that I really like. So uh, cooperative peer-to-peer -peer systems are services that nobody owns. So they sort of challenge this idea that we have of private property on the web. Um, how do you make money? I don't know. I guess you probably don't really make money. That's kind of problematic for, for reasons. But um, you can create abundance, which I personally find rewarding. I guess you could get grants or build a community-based currency or something. I, I don't really know. But I'm not here to answer that question. I'm just here to show you how to build these things. So uh, nobody's in charge. Nobody can charge rent. Nobody's more important. This is sort of a more flat topology that we can build on the web. So here's some examples. Secure Scuttlebutt, I mentioned. This is a peer-to-peer -peer social database. Uh, BitTorrent is a way to distribute content and also IPFS on a thing called the DHT. Uh, similar story with Dat and Hyperdrive. And we'll look at Hyperlog in a bit. So DHTs are a way that you can look up content, uh, like look up uh, the hash of a file in a big network where everybody's connected. That's OK. Um, that's a good way of doing things sometimes, if everyone's connected. Uh, but a lot of the time, we're not all connected. So there's some other ideas, like a Kappa architecture, where you have an append-only log. And you, so you only add things to the end. and you build uh, indexes on top of that log. So the log is the source of truth, and the indexes help you answer questions more quickly than reading every single item in that log. Uh, you can combine that with a gossip network, which is a way of connecting peers to each other. Randomly is a good way to start. I'll show you a little bit about that. Uh, a thing about namespaces as well, namespaces are sort of uh, not cooperative because they're exclusive. So instead, a, n a nice way to do things is to use cryptographic hashes because when you hash something or you take a public key, it's a sort of random string of numbers. So that's sort of inherently a flat kind of namespace. And there's different ways of dealing with, with uh, systems you can build on top of hashes. But hashes as the starting point and public keys is a fantastic way to go. Just kind of have to abandon some ideas that we are used to. But uh, So for identities, one thing you can do is use public keys 
uh, as the identity itself. So if you use an ed25519 curve, uh, those are very short, like 32 or 64 bytes, I forget exactly. And then you can sign every message to your log. This is very simple. Uh, there's a module in NPM called Chloride you can use for that. And also names. So I talked a bit about names earlier in this conference, but I think a way that can work really well is just names are what your friends call you. So there can be two Johns in a room, and that's OK. We'll figure out how to deal with that. Like one of you can be like, I don't know, John Q and John H. That's fine. Like humans know how to deal with these problems. These, these are not things that we need the technology to No, There can only be one John on the entire planet Earth, the entire universe. That's, that's not going to work, especially not offline. Uh, so in the secure scuttlebutt network model, when you follow somebody's feed, you actually help to replicate their data. So your followers help to host your content. And if you have a gossip network where people randomly connect to each other, and there are better ways of doing it, but that's a good place to start, then you can start to build uh, things like Twitter replacements, things like Facebook replacements, things like GitHub replacements that nobody owns, that just exist, that you can take for granted, that you don't have to worry about the API is going to update, or the, they're going to get it acquired. No, that's, that's not something we have to tolerate. Uh, OK, so I talked about the Kappa architecture. Uh, this is where you build materialized views on top of a log. Talked about Merkle DAGs like Git for the logs. Uh, another problem is that we as technologists sort of decide things on behalf of our users, and that's really not very good. Um, really, I think in addition to these peer-to-peer -peer approaches, we ought to be thinking about ways to involve users so they're active participants. We're not just telling them. We're not just being technocratic. OK, so uh, tiny modules. I like them. I think they're good for peer production. So let's use some. All right, so let's build a peer-to-peer -peer social network. OK, so I like to start everything at 0. So I'm going to make a directory called, uh, uh, I'll call it cool net, cool net, why not? All right, I've already installed some modules. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start writing some browser code. So we're going to need a database that lives in the browser. I like to use uh, this thing called leveldb. So in Node.js, you can do require level. But in the browser, just do require level browserify. And behind the scenes, it'll use indexdb instead of, uh, instead of uh, leveldb, which is a database built by Google, actually to implement indexdb, which is really hard to use. So I would just use level. All right, so you start level. You give it a database name. Uh, I'll call it CoolNet, I guess, whatever. Um, it just uniquely identifies the database. A module for building one of those uh, Merkle DAGs, which is called Hyperlog. So Merkle DAGs, uh, every document that you add has a hash. And when you add a new document, you point to the hash of the previous document. This is really good for peer distribution because every document points back at another one, and you can't ever change uh, the content. So adversaries in, in between, like if you get things in a gossip network, you're connecting to other peers, they can't manipulate the data, which is a very useful property. It also is a more robust property. Um, so you create a hyperlog by giving it a, a level DB instance, and you can set a value encoding. I'm going to set one of JSON, so this is just automatically going to do JSON. All right, so the next thing we can do is uh, we can do uh, so there's a log.add method where you uh, specify the links. These are the hashes of the prior documents you want to point to. But in this case, I'm going to use a, a method called append, which just points at whatever the latest log item is. So I do log.append. Uh, well, we're in the browser, so I better make some HTML. So I like to use this package called yo-yo to do that. Uh, so here we're going to have a DOM tree, and it's going to do DOM diffing, not with a virtual DOM, but with real DOM. Anyways. So I return html.update. I need a root node, so I'm going to go ahead and make one of those really quick. This is the only uh, document.body.appendChild document. I'll just do the nine. Document.create element div. All right, so we have our root element. We're going to now use a tagged template string. Great ES6 feature. It's pretty much the only one I use for, for right now. But uh, so we'll make a div. And uh, I'll just say hi. And I'll make a text area. Actually, maybe I'll say cool net. I'll make a text area. I'll give the text area a name. Um, message, why not? Uh, that should live in a form that has an on submit. So we're just going to basically have a form where we can post things. So button type equals submit. 
uh, post, I'll call it. Okay, so this ought to be enough now to append items to our log. So now I'm gonna implement that on submit function, ev.prevent default to prevent the to prevent the default um, form behavior sending a get. And now I do this.elements.message.value, that's our message. And what I can do now is call log.append with that data. So I'm gonna do log.append. Uh, I'm gonna set it to be content message. Okay, and... Form open tag. Oh, thank you. Great audience participation, I love it. Okay, so we have log.append. Uh, if there's an error, I'll just print a console.error. Uh, also, what I'm gonna do is track some state. So this is like your basic Redux architecture without Redux, so say messages, an array, and I'm just gonna uh, state.messages.push, whatever the message body was, so this is like uh, doc. Save that to a variable, like so. Push the doc, and then call update again. Okay, so uh, the final thing I need to do, I need to call this update function to start with, and uh, that should write things to our database. So now, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna run Budo, which just starts a little server and browserifies it for us. So if I go to localhost on the port, It's uh, browserifying quite a lot of code behind the scenes. There's an awful lot of code that we're taking advantage of. Here we go, cool net. Uh, so I say, hello, post. Now, all right, so I haven't uh, actually rendered the messages, so why don't I go ahead and do that? So I'm gonna have a little uh, HR tag. HR tags are great, whatever. Uh, and I'm gonna do state.messages.map. So for every message, we're just gonna Put it into the DOM, why not? Okay, so I'll just put a pre-tag in there for now, and json.stringify it. So we can take a look. The other thing I need to do is when the, when the application first loads, I need to do, uh, DB, uh, I need to do log.createReadStream to just basically read it, everything that's already been posted into the database. And I can pass in live true, which will automatically uh, add new elements. I'm just gonna use a couple of libraries that's a Node.js stream, so I'm just gonna pipe into this thingy called two, and those are objects, so then I have every row, and I'm just gonna state.messages.push row next, and call update. Okay, so now when I load it, whoops, 25, error. Okay, so I forgot to close the brace, reload, and here we go, we have our document that we posted. That's kind of cool, I guess. Uh, you know, I might say, wow, as well. Just HTML. And I see, well, that's cool, it updated live. Um, pretty neat. Uh, so, what else can we do? Well, because we're using a Kappa architecture, because we're using an append-only log, we can replicate this data to a peer. What does that look like? Well, uh, so, I'm gonna open another window here. This is not an incognito window, so it'll be a different database. Uh, the problem is, I need to connect these databases somehow. So what I can do is I can use this module called WebRTC Swarm to hook them together. So it's, I'll do wswarm equals require WebRTC Swarm. I need to also set up a signal hub. So signal hub is a server, but it doesn't do anything. All that it does is it, it uh, introduces peers um, to connect over WebRTC, but it doesn't actually deal with the data. So the server, uh, for example, I use the same server in all of the demos, and it's run by somebody else, and they don't have to be involved at all. It's, it's not completely peer-to-peer -peer in this particular case, but the rest of it is. So, uh, so I can create the swarm now from wswarm, and I pass in a signal hub. You pass in a, a name, which is like a channel in IRC, for example. Uh, I'll call this a cool net, and then you pass in an array of servers. So I'm gonna use this one at uh, signalhub.mathintosh.com, which is the author, Mathintosh, who I also use a lot of, I use a lot of modules from Mathintosh. Okay, so when I get a peer connection, 
uh, this event fires, so I'm going to say peer, and I'll just print out the ID. Now, uh, this peer is a duplex stream, which is like in Node.js when you do net.createServer, you get a duplex stream. So what I can do is there's a method on hyperlog called log.replicate, and I can pipe the peer stream into log.replicate and then pipe that back into peer. And this just sets up each connection to talk, sets up each stream to talk to each other. Uh, I can also do live replication, which is fun. So I ought to receive updates uh, whenever the page, or whenever either side appends content. So now, if I open the debugger on both, I'll make it big, and reload. So I'll reload that one, reload this one. Wait a second. Peer, look over here on the right. Now we have the same data everywhere. So. This is an example for how you can build peer-to-peer -peer architecture. Um, I should also notice, or I should also say that the, the peer replication is replication is bidirectional. So I ought to be able to post here as well. And yeah, so on the left now, it connected over that WebRTC connection. Now I'm seeing the same data in both places. Pretty good. Also, if I'm offline. Each side, each browser tab, or each browser window in this case, would be on a different computer. Each user could be adding appending documents to their log, and when they get back online, the data will replicate, like it'll mesh back together. So this, if you have a service worker or app cache or something, uh, putting this technology, um, making it available offline using standard techniques on the web, you have an offline web app, pretty cool. So, what else can we do? So, um, I was kind of asked to make this a little more interesting. So, in a bit, I'm going to start making sounds, and there's going to be moving images and things. So, just that warning. So, uh, what if we render HTML? What if we have a uh, Twitter-style peer-to-peer net social network where you, we send around HTML fragments? That'll be fun. Uh, it's not good for security, but what, whatever, it's security. Okay, so what we can do for rendering is, uh, instead of this pre-tag, I think the doc dot, um, uh, because I turned on live replication, I don't have to do that, so I'll just refresh in both places. Okay, so there's a doc, right, dot content. Is, there's also links and things in there, but if I use doc dot content now, and I'm just gonna render whatever that was into the page directly without a pre-tag. So to do that, I can actually uh, document.createElement. Well, I could do it this way, but I think what I wanna do actually is have one frame, and then uh, I'll have a button that you can click that sort of like puts the HTML into that frame. So I'm gonna have some pieces of state now called uh, content, uh, and that'll just be whatever, an empty string, and the state.content I will set in the HTML update thingy to be, well, I'll just render it. So this is the cool thing, because we're not using a virtual DOM, we can use real DOM elements. Uh, so I'll just call it content, cool. All right, so content, actually I don't need to track that in state at all. I'll do uh, content equals document.createElement iframe. So this is a cool trick with, um, I'll call it frame actually. No. Okay, so this is the cool thing about iframes. Uh, if you set their SRC to about blank, you can actually mess with them. It's pretty fun. Okay, so we have our iframe. I think I called it content, so let me fix that again. Okay, so we should have an iframe in the page now. If I reload it, it should be empty. Reload, yeah, there we go. So there's our iframe. Uh, now I'm gonna make a button. So here in this pre-tag, uh, you know, I don't have to really change that very much, but I'll just put a button at the end. So button, and then on click equals show, sla uh, show slash button. So when you click show, what it should do is it should do frame dot content window dot document dot body dot enter HTML equals, and then doc dot content. I think that ought to work. So, and then, yeah, I don't even have to update the DOM or anything, but what I do have to do is actually copy this. So, yeah, actually, I better track that in this state. Hang on a sec. 
content. Yeah, and then I'll do this up here. So this just works better with the Reduxy architecture. But you can cheat. Cheating is great. Um, I highly recommend cheating where appropriate. In, in technology, of course, not in, not in real life. That's, that's bad, don't do that. Okay, so uh, we have our iframe. I've set the source, let's see. So I also need to set, uh, I need to put back a content variable, it's our state management. I reload. Oh, there's an error. Content of, document of null. Oh, right, sorry, I need to actually stick that in the DOM before I can do this, so. Um, stick that in the DOM before I can do this, okay. Uh, if frame.parent node, this is a hack as well. That might work. Okay, so this might work. Oh. Sorry, I still have that stuff in a pre-tag for some reason. The buttons aren't showing up. All right, I'm just gonna get rid of that part. I think there's a syntax error somewhere. Oh, this is the worst kind of, a oh, I see. I forgot to tag template string. Should have known better, all right, now it works. Very good, okay, so now if I click show, uh, should see a value, which I don't see, so I'm gonna cheat again, and I'm gonna also set, the, oh, I forgot to call update. And I'm also gonna set the frame, whatever, uh, dot content window dot document dot, dot inner HTML equals state dot content. Okay, reload, reload. So now, I don't see anything. Oh, well, you get the idea. So, what I wanted to do, which we can still do, is uh, let's not worry so much about iframes and trickery like that. Let's figure out some content that we might wanna share in this peer-to-peer -peer network. I can still share it. So. One fun thing is to do web audio. So web audio is something that browsers can do. So I'm running a little server for turning JavaScript into music. So I'm gonna boost the sound all the way. So here you, he you hear a sine wave at 441 hertz, about middle A on a keyboard. That's pretty cool, you can multiply by other waves. So like, so let's make some music. Uh, let's see, so I'm gonna go to this one, Waves, and what I like to do is I like to start out with a little bit of a beat, so I'm gonna do two, uh, sine of 100 plus sine of 50, uh, and that's gonna be modulated by sine of 0.1 times 0.1 plus 0.5, that's, okay, so we've got this cool bassy sound that sort of like is wowing at about, uh, one cycle every 10 seconds. Now, let's modulate that by something else. So I'm gonna take a sawtooth wave. I can make a beat. Make it faster. I can also use a power function to sort of cut it up. So I could do math.pow, that, four. And it's sort of like, it uh, adjusts the enveloping. So we, it's JavaScript, so let's do a ternary expression. Whoa, sorry. It does that sometimes. So T modulo four greater than three, we wanna do like a da 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 da, otherwise. All right, that's fun. So how's, this is basically how music works, you know, it's just a wave over time between negative one and one. So that's fun. Uh, what I can also do is I'll add, well, I don't wanna kill the music, so I'm gonna comment that as I work on it. So let's make a melody. Melodies are, in Western music, there's this idea of 12-tone tonality, so I'm gonna make up some numbers. It's pretty much what composers do. Um, like this. All right, so there's a melody, basically. 
Now I'm gonna take uh, the I'm gonna take those numbers, I'm gonna loop over them one by one. I'm gonna do the floor of time modulo the length of that array, and I'm gonna divide that number by 12. Okay, and then I'm gonna do this little bit of trickery, okay, and multiply by like a smaller number. So now we have a solid wave. Faster. We can make it lower. We can add harmonics. We can also add enveloping. So I'm just going to copy paste this bit. So, oh, I don't need the, that part necessarily, but. That's just multiplication, right? So let's make two melodies. That's what I like to do a lot of time. So I'm going to have M0 and M1, and they're going to run at different speeds. That's a nice trick, uh, so you can sort of use the same data structures. You don't have to define more. Make one of them slower. Make one of them faster, and make one of make them at uh, different bass beats uh, or different frequencies. So, it's usually good to make that one higher. So that's fun. Copy paste. Uh, stick it into our social network. So here's our post button. Post. So uh, we just published that to our peers now. We can start. Just gonna pause it for a sec. So what else can we do? Well, why don't we also do some WebGL and post that to our peer-to-peer -peer social network? Our peer-to-peer -peer social network would be great. All right. So let's just. Make some WebGL. All right, here's how I like to do that. Uh, gonna main JS. So I like to use this module called Regal. It's just a wrapper. It's sort of a functional wrapper around the audio, the uh, the WebGL API. So I'll do it. Create blob. I'm gonna make a blob. I'm gonna use uh, Icosphere. This is a package you can use to generate simplicial complexes, which is a sort of data structure that's easy to stuff onto the GPU. So these have things like um, Positions and cells, lists of vertices, lists of faces. Go, yeah. Uh, so, how you use Regal is you provide uh, these things: a fragment shader and a vertex shader. Uh, the job of the fragment shader is you write them like this. You do a bit of boilerplate. That's what you put for the first thing. You do void main because it's actually C. So we're writing C right now in JavaScript. It's pretty weird, but we do geofrag color. So we can set it to be cyan. I like cyan, that's a good color. Uh, then we do the same thing with the void main and all in our vertex shader. The vertex shader's job is to map coordinates into screen space. So I'm gonna set GL position and there's gonna be an attribute that we're gonna pass in. So do a vec3 attribute position, we take position equals, and then just it's got to be a vec4, so we'll take the position x, y, which is, and just set the z to zero, and set the extra one to one, because reasons, I don't know actually why. Anyways, we do attributes, so we set position to be uh, like mesh dot positions, and then we set up the triangles, which are mesh dot cells. So that's pretty much all that you need, aside from a little draw function here, so I'm gonna do blob, create blob. 
I'd like to pass in the Regal instance as well. It's nice to do so that I can split those functions out into separate files and call draw.blob, see what that looks like. Okay, so if I run budo now on that server, um, if I go to gl, budo main.js, and now if I reload, we get a circle in webgl. Not very interesting yet. So what else can we do? Well, let's uh, set up a camera system. And let's also do uh, a background color. So let's do black, because it's cyberpunk, 0001. Depth true, it's the depth buffer. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, so what we'll do is we can uh, set up a module called regal camera. So I do require regal camera. Pass in regal. You can pass in options like the distance as well. So distance of three. And then I'm going to do a frame loop as well. I'm not going to get in too much to this. OK, so now uh, the other things that we have is in our vertex shader, uniform at four, uh, projection view, like so. And then you multiply projection times the view times the position x, y, z in this case. And is that all? Yeah, I think so. All right, refresh. Oh, it's, there's a background that's set correctly. Looks like there's probably an error. Let's figure out what it is. Um, good opportunity to show you what the errors look like. This one is in our draw loop because there's thousands of messages. Whoa, I can't even read it. This is the problem. When you have a request animation frame going, you can't even, oh, right, the view vector wasn't set correctly. Um, what? Bad data for, oh, I see why. All right, so the reason is I actually need to call the camera like that. I didn't even set up the camera. Okay, reload. There we go. Hooray, so now I can zoom in and out. Pretty cool. Okay, so uh, what else can I do? Well, I can use modules in my shader code, tiny modules that do one thing well. So let's just do this thing, which is using a thing called GLSLify. We're gonna, that's also a tag template string function, so require GLSLify. Then in your vertex shader and your fragment shader, put GLSL in front of the back tick, like so. Do pragma, GLSLify. I'm gonna use one called snoise, which is great, GLSL noise. Uh, I'm gonna use 4D noise. 4D noise is cool. I'm also gonna pass in a, a time variable so we can sync it up to the music in one moment. So uniform. Uniforms, uh, time is regal.context time, something that uh, regal tracks internally. So we have our noise, we have our float time. Now what I'm gonna do is do the same thing in the vertex shader. So first thing we can do is make, uh, make our color based on noise, and I'm gonna use another thing, HSL to RGB. So these are just packages. They're, like, you can use NPM modules in your shader code as well. So HSL to RGB, so vec3 color equals HSL to RGB of uh, maybe the S noise for the hue. So float H equals, so we're gonna do HSL, and then the color goes there, and then a one at the end for the alpha channel. So the S noise of vec3 of a varying variable that we pass in don't have to explain too much. We just want something cool to share on our social network. So I'm going to set uh, vpause equals position, like so. And then in our uh, HSL calculation, we're going to do vec3 of, or sorry, it's just vpause. It's vec4, vpause comma time. So once I do that, and then the saturation will be a lot, because bright colors and luminosity 0.5. Bright colors, all right, if I reload. Cool, a bit fast actually, I'm gonna slow it down a little bit. Also gonna modulate that so that we're only dealing with a smaller slice of the color space, so like plus 0.6 is pretty good. That's like, should be bluish kinda. Yeah, a bit slower. Uh, you can also take like the power uh, of these things, so also if you want like the luminosity calculation, we can do that. So maybe we'll also take the power of that function, like four. Um, like that. 
Yeah. What's that? Yes, that's where I'm going. So, uh, and then like times maybe to the two. I'll reload it. All right, so we've got a cool uh, background thing. I'm going to make it blobby first really quick because blobby spheres look pretty cool. So you can use S noise again here in our uh, vertex shader. So if we take the position, which in a spheres case is actually the surface normal, so I don't have to compute that. And I'll do the same trick, vec4 of position, comma time, times 0.1, maybe a bit slower. And then v pause and reload. Cool, blobby sphere. Uh, I'm going to make that a little more exaggerated. Whoa, cool. Oh, it's hard to see. Let's boost the color or boost the light because this projector is pretty dark. So I'll add plus five. There you go. Now you can see it better, I think. Cool blobby sphere. Uh, now let's put back on our music. You can look at it. You notice it uh, doesn't run as well because it's actually doing multiple things at once. So why don't I go ahead and copy paste? And then I have to change one thing. It's the return value should be module.exports. Uh, there's a small module you can use for your shader code. So it's called Web Audio. It maps the script processor node API. And you pass it a function that takes a parameter t, which is time. So I'll require song.js. And I'll call b.play. And now if I reload, what's that? I missed what? No, that's fine. OK, so see what the real culprit is now. Whoops. Yeah, I know that. It's fine. Um, So why isn't it playing? Let me just double check. Song dot, what? I'm in cool net still. Just double check this. That looks good. We were just listening to it. Um, why don't I just test something really quick? Um, well, that has to be written differently. You can also do it in no, but it's kind of slow. Um, so module dot exports equals function of t parameter time to play. Uh, oh, this is the wrong demo. I, was, I still had that open. Sorry about that. Uh, let's go to the real demo. I was editing the wrong file, and I will. Well, so audio require web audio, and then. B equals body of require dot slash long dot js b dot play reload there we go cool so let's go ahead and just share that in our social network now in our social network, but paste, post, and there it is. So we just put that on our social network. We've got a cool little WebGL demo. All right. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. Thanks. to be giving a workshop tomorrow. So if you want to learn more about this stuff. <laughs>